we working now? We're getting louder and louder. Okay, it's working. Hello, everybody. Come on in. People standing outside, come on in. Fill up these seats. Um, welcome to this session um, on the real world. If you're here, it probably means the real world confuses you um, too, just like the rest of us. And you're coming here looking for clarity. And we're going to offer it. Um, uh, my name's Andy Calkins. I'm the director of an initiative uh, nonprofit thing called Next Generation Learning Challenges, nextgenlearning.org, on your radio dial. Um, and we have worked for eight years or so to catalyze schools that are really focused on the future of work and redefining success around what that looks like. A number of those schools and partners are in the room um, when I'm just so glad and so proud to see you here. Um, so thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, uh, I'm going to have the panel introduce themselves. And just to really confuse you, they're not sitting in the order that you sit up there. <laughs> so who thinks they know who Brandon is? I know. This is like, yeah, right. So, right. I know. Wait, so who's Brandon? Who's Brandon? <laughs> no. I wish I had that title. Yeah. So we'll just start here with Sean. Why don't you, why don't you do two, two minutes, two sentences Seconds. on yourself, and then we'll blast down that way. You so. got it. Uh, Sean McCalmont. I'm responsible for career readiness education at K-12 Inc. Uh, the majority of my 25 years in education have been on the higher ed career readiness side, and uh, K-12, we're really trying to build bridges between higher education and, uh, and K-12. Great. Uh, for those of you that don't recognize me, I'm Andre Agassi's brother. <laughs> <laughs> so if you didn't see Andre Agassi, you say, it's okay, I saw his brother. Um, I'm Eric Bernjen. I am the Education Program Manager for P-TECH. Uh, how many of you know what P-TECH is? We've got two people. Wonderful. Excellent. Good. Can, I, can I tell them quickly? I, you, I'm, you used up one sentence. <laughs> now you got one other. Make it a long one. Okay. Okay. All right. So PTEC is a three-way partnership between a community college, high school, and corporate partner. And I oversee that piece on behalf of IBM. And kids in our program get a no-cost associate's degree. They don't pay a dime. Um, they get mentors from IBM, of which we have 135 in our district and uh, they get internship opportunities and hopefully uh, workforce placement. That had a lot of complicated punctuation in it, but it was yeah. one <laughs> sentence, so good for you. Okay, Andy could do it. Brandon. All right. I'm Brandon Schaefer. <laughs> I am the Executive Director of Legal and Governmental Affairs, Community Outreach, and P-TECH, Pathways in Technology, Early College High School for the St. Brain Valley School District in Longmont, Colorado. And in a past life, I was the chairman of the Colorado Parole Board. So interesting stories there, uh, interesting uh, background there. And before that, I was the president of the Colorado Senate and the state legislature. So uh, lots of different perspectives I bring to the table. And as far as I can tell, looking in the audience here, uh, there's only one other gentleman in this room who's wearing a tie, uh, other than myself. So you know, I, I wasn't sure whether to keep the tie, leave the, anyway. So I see him. He's over there on the side. There you go. All right. <laughs> it's not Andre Agassi either. It's not Andre no, Agassi. It's, it's, it's but I, I, I see you. Okay. I see you. Thank you. Ed. Um, Ed Hidalgo, Chief Innovation and Engagement Officer for the Cajon Valley Union School District. We're a school district just east. Um, you can clap. It's amazing. 12 uh, miles away or so. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Got yeah, 27 schools, 17,000 students, public school district. We serve 22,000 meals a day. Yeah. Um, yeah. I spent most of my, my career in, um, in corporate, hiring talent. Um, my specialty was contingent labor, importing contingent labor from around the globe into our nation. And now I have the unique opportunity to be developing, deploying a career development framework for every child, every grade, and every year, starting in kindergarten. Great. Thank you. So. Um, We've posed a really um, uh, provocative question in our title, and we're going to go to that in one second. But first, um, was anybody in here for the Science of Learning session right before lunch? Yeah, OK. Um, did you feel the same thing I felt, which was a sense of like absurd competition with the room next door? Because there was all this like 
clapping and you know all this stuff and everything. And here we all were science of learning. You know, this is the K-12 space. Courtney, are you still in here? So, so this is the place that has been, you know, devoted to K-12 in in this much larger thing. So I'm going to suggest that if there's a moment of like, you know, clapping and whatever happening right next door, just watch me. We're going to go one, two three, and then let it rip, okay? <laughs> With just like, I want to hear Eric like chanting and screaming, and we want to have applause and whoops, okay? And we'll just like right totally show these higher ed sure. people like, you know, actually you're a higher ed guy, so. so but I, I, but, yeah. <laughs> I straddle. You do, okay. Actually, do you want to try one right now? <laughs> no, 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 the whole point is we're gonna, we gonna one up them when they do their little yeah, thing, got it. okay? We could. Yeah, I'm out. with you, man. I'm with Why you. Wait? I love this enthusiasm. <laughs> if, if, it, if it doesn't, if they don't like break out in the first 10 minutes, then we'll, let's do that. Okay. But let's, let's just see if they queue it up. All right. Good. Okay. So here's our question. What does real world learning, re learning look like when real world jobs are changing so rapidly? I mean, you know, we, know this is, we, we all want to help prepare our kids for the real world. Um, and in the past, um, there's been this sort of dichotomy between um, occupational preparation, CTE programs, voc tech, and so on. Those are like <laughs> one, two, three. Yeah! Come on! Yeah, baby! Yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay. I think maybe we do the wave. What do you think? Come on. We'll show it on closed circuit TV. Well, so do we go back at them? What do we think? Or we wait for a little while? Okay, we'll wait. We'll wait. Okay. So, uh, right, so before there was a straight pathway to a bunch of jobs, and we knew they were jobs, and they paid some kind of wage, and there was like, you know, okay, a system, a thing, a bunch of pathways. Now, there's all this yak about how half the jobs that exist today are going to disappear in the next 10 to 15 years. The, most of the new jobs have not yet been invented. I mean, we all know this. We all see it. Um, and so the question is, all right, what the hell is the real world that we are trying to prepare today's students for? And for those of you, all of us, who are concerned with trying to prepare them for that, what does that mean if we're trying to do real world learning in our high schools? So that's why we've got um, like two real people down at the end here who are working with kids all the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, 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 um, and two helpers, you know, <laughs> helping, helpers. helping specimens that are helping the real people down there who are like <laughs> real. So I'm, a, I'm just a helping specimen too, I want you to know. Okay, these are they're like real people out there that I'm helping, so it's okay. It's a noble thing. It's a noble calling. Um, but these guys are deep in it, deep in it, both creating stuff um, to help drive the, a good answer to this question, and people and partners who are, you know, like inventing what this looks like on a daily basis. Um, so we're going to start, we're going to have two parts. Um, to this discussion. Part A is really about world of work. I've asked these guys not to say anything that you have already heard. So if that happens, you just like raise your hand and then they'll have to stop and they'll like start over again, okay? It's because we all know, you know, that's the, that's the real world today's kids are going into. But we're gonna focus a little bit on, you know, okay, world, world of work. Uh, what, what does that represent um, in terms of not just the sort of 21st century skill sets, we all know about all that too, but something more specific, explicit, explicit, you know, and preparation, what's taking the place of today's CTE programs that had a job at the end of them with a future to it, right? So we're gonna start with that, with these two, get some comments down there, and then part B is gonna be how do we, what's the design for preparation um, for, of, of, of kids for that world? And that's when we're going to start down there and then get comments from up here. 
good so far. We're gonna leave room for about eight to 10 minutes of Q&A from the end, so start parking your questions up here. And we're gonna to try to do those really, really fast because we don't have much time. So, Sean, just Andy. bring it. All right, well, again, raise your hand if you hear something. <laughs> Please don't. It's a high bar. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Andy raises a, a critical question that doesn't have an easy answer. I think historically, especially coming from the higher ed side, I think that there was a thought that the more education you had, the more education you got traditionally, the better prepared you would be for certain types of jobs. Does everybody agree with that? The baccalaureate was almost a, a, a threshold that you had to clear to get certain jobs, historically. I think what's happened, oh, and by the way, if you didn't have that traditional education, where were you relegated in, in high school? Shop class, voc tech, and, and it didn't have a positive connotation. It didn't have a, it didn't have a positive uh, thought to it. It was, it was a negative bias, and, and that was unfortunate. So I think fast forward, um, the, the, econ the economy has changed. It's driven by technological uh, advancement and change. And I think today, what we've found is that it's a different collection of skills that prepares a student to be uh, successful later on in their career. What we found in talking to industry, and as K-12 des designs our career readiness program that is, is done about 90% virtually, uh, we look at a couple of different things. Number one, how does a student gain confidence and how, how, how can you make them uh, more flexible in terms of their future uh, career aspirations? Uh, number two, you know, how can they work in a project-based way uh, and, and understand the concept of team? Uh, number three, how do they get the technical proficiency for the job that's required? It's not just this general hard skill or soft skill or, or level of education. And so we found that, that it's all of the above, but it's this comprehensive, sort of well-rounded student that we've got to figure out how to prepare. As we hear from industry, what we've tried to do is really replicate that in their learning. And we've moved that to earlier levels. So many of you have experienced uh, middle school uh, career exploration courses. That, that is a bare minimum for us in terms of career readiness. From there, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, later on about how we're doing it, specifically at K-12, but, but in summary, it, it is a, a well-rounded, flexible, confident student that we've got to uh, uh, help develop. And I'll just say very quickly, yesterday, I had the opportunity to be interviewed by three high school sophomores on the Road Trip Nation uh, RV. Does everybody see the big green RV out it. there? You everybody have. knows what Road Trip Nation is. Uh, they were, they were hard-hitting questions, harder than Andy's. Uh, but it was fantastic, and it was, it was sort of a, a highlight for me uh, over the last uh, couple of years, just hearing from these young people. And um, I, I was a, a high school athlete and then a college athlete. All three of them were, were, were student athletes, and they asked me the question, what should we be thinking about in terms of preparing ourselves for the future? And I said, all of those skills that you use in terms of practicing for your athletics, replicate those in terms of your career practice and preparation. Athletics, you practice to be able to compete. We have to help young people understand that they've got to practice to prepare to compete in a rapidly changing environment. And so that's, that's how we focused uh -huh. on what industry is looking for and how we'll uh, address it. So kids could productively do the kinds of things that they're doing right now in Vogue Tech stuff, but the thought is that this is, this is practice uh, for all kinds of possibilities coming later, not just simply uh, like act one to a, then an act that's pretty well played out. Right? Exactly, okay. and just think about how young people have been advised over time, whether it's your parents or a counselor, advisor, or a teacher, sometimes it's out of the lens of that advisor. And so how many career prospects do students really know about once they graduate or getting close to graduation? Like how many careers do you think they are, they are well aware of before they graduate? 10? Yeah. That's probably maybe high. Yes. All right, yes. that they know the details around those careers. Oh. So I think exploration oh. is, is one part because it, it gives them a view of what the, what the scope is. But industry um, informing some of those decisions is absolutely critical. And I know there are people in the audience, the, uh, Ed, they, they've done great jobs of bringing industry into the classroom. And we use a platform called Nepris that many of you have heard about. 
uh, to do that. And I think what, what it does is it gives them a, a view into the modern workplace. It helps them now uh, you know, really uh, structure how their practice really should be shaped. Mm -hmm. And, and it allows them to practice things that they might not have yeah. seen earlier. Great. Eric, you from IBM. So um, before we actually started the school, Brandon and I went on a listening tour. And we went out and we interviewed company after company after company. Um, and just, just so you know, our model is designed to, to to produce kids that can work anywhere along the front range of Colorado. There's actually 200 schools throughout the globe. I encourage any, anybody and everybody, please add me on LinkedIn if you're interested in learning more. I'd be more than happy to have a conversation. And when we went out, there was one common theme that continued to reiterate itself. And so I'm a former basketball coach. Shock, I'm 6'4". I mean, you know, <laughs> it's kind of, you know, I went right into that stereotype. Uh, is they, they, don't, they don't want people that can shoot the three. They, they, they don't want people that, can really, that are really great at dunking the ball. They want the greatest athlete. They want somebody that can come in and adapt. And if you think about the world of education, half of what I learned in college is no longer applicable. Uh, regards to some of my tech skills because things have progressed. So I think it's really fostering the mindset, getting students to understand that they do need to have a growth mindset. And I know that that's a common buzzword right now, um, but you really do because the idea of this lifelong profession, this lifelong career doesn't necessarily exist in the same manner in which it did. So the, the theme about adaptability is really huge. Uh, so that's one of the things that, you know, it's no special formula. We just enforce it day in, day in and day out of, of getting students to understand that you have to be adaptable. You have to be flexible. So I actually create these assignments for those of you. How many of you in here are teachers? District people? Okay. I, I immerse them into a problem in which they have no foundational understanding. And I, I look at them and I say, uh, Go figure it out. And they're immersed in this, and they're Googling, and they're channeling, and they're looking for all these different solutions and answers. And that's what our life is becoming. We're no longer in this day and age where rote memorization is key, right? We have to be able to access information and do it quickly. So our big piece is adaptability. Uh, and also having a great foundation of skills. So somebody says, well, we need kids in AI. No, you don't. You need programmers. And before you need programmers, you need them to have a foundational understanding of what programming is. So my big advice to you is adaptability and creating that foundation in programming or whatever tech piece that they're, they're going to use because they will need that foundation. They will rely on that foundation, and that foundation will determine how well their house is built. Right? Great. So. Let's go from that cue from Eric, um, Ed, down to you, because Ed, Ed is in a district that is a K-8 district. So when most of us and everybody out there thinks about this question and where the locus of, of thought and work happens in their schools, it's at the high school level. These guys have become national leaders at K-8 in helping kids learn to be adaptable and nine other things. So. Tell us what that looks like. So I would say yes and. My heart is pumping right now because of this topic. Um, because I worked and hired engineers, high wage, high skill, top universities, MIT, Berkeley, Stanford, Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech, that had the skill, were not happy in their jobs. They had been on a conveyor belt of education, internship, 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 masters, job, what am I doing here? High skill, high wage, top universities, computer science, hardware, systems, test, not in the right role. My heart is pumping because I had to engage with those individuals and try to help them pull out of that career dissatisfaction. And they're very expensive too, so the company is not happy. And I worked for a big company, hiring lots of them. 
So to me, and for my own journey, by the way, very poor student, struggled deeply in math, probably dyslexic if my kids are any reference to who I am and how I learn, and yet my children have beautiful strengths, interests, and workplace values that are needed in the world. So in our district, and I'm so proud of our principals and teachers are here today, they are going deep with our students, helping them discover the unique strengths. What do they do well naturally? Tie back to Gallup's research. Their interests, what do we know about interests? They have the highest correlation to career success, performance, and income of any of the personality measures. Look at the meta research, James Rounds out of Illinois. And then workplace values, something that no one seems to be comfortable with talking about, because they always want to talk about passion. Well, asking people about their passions, you're, you know, really thinking that they get their passion out of their work anyways. <laughs> but it may not come out of their work, and they may not have never found their passion, so maybe not, don't want that to be part of their work. So we talk about workplace values, and it's really what keeps you in a job. Do you wanna wear flip-flops? Do you wanna wear a suit? Do you wanna work outdoors? Do you wanna work inside? Do you wanna make, make a lot of money? Do you wanna do social good? We need to unpack these three elements, not just knowledge, skills, and abilities, to understand the whole child, and help them develop a vision of their future possible selves based on who they are and who they want to become. So, has anybody in this room read Todd Rose's new book, Dark Horse? Yeah, of course you have, yes. So it's about the, the, the science of fulfillment, basically, which is, I think, a, a way of summing up what you just said. And he, he's, Todd's great, he, he's like Malcolm Gladwell. He just, he laces his storytelling with great research that then you try to dredge out when you're like in the bar three weeks later and you can't quite do it, but you know it's there. And, and it, it's all about how what Ed just said is in fact the most crucial driver. You know, if you have made choices all the way along that are in line with what you have learned about yourself in terms of what will fulfill you, whatever it is that's most important to you, you know, then you're gonna perform at your highest level. Uh, and, and one choice will then lead to the next logical choice. So, thank you. So, I, can I just add one quick thing? Please, on yeah. One, one thing that we're talking about making a, a requirement is all of our students do job shadows, right? Which is really in terms of workforce readiness and identifying, is this a career fit for you? So they'll do them through IBM. They do roughly three over freshman, sophomore, junior year. One of the things that we're talking about doing in terms of a graduation requirement is having our students go out and find their own job shadow about something that is completely different than the program that they're enrolled in to really see are you finding the career that is gonna be a match for you? Um, you know, it's, it's really funny. It, when, I, when you sit down and you ask people, like, if, if you had $20,000 and somebody says, I'll sell you my car, what would be the first thing that you would say? So some of you have different comments. Can I get it for 18? You know, <laughs> but, or, but you'd say, I wanna test drive it. But in the world of education, we don't operate that way, right? So we'll go make a $100,000 commitment not fully knowing that this school has exactly what I want to do. Now, I'm not saying that this is always the case, but in some of the cases, this could be alleviated by starting to get the kids to do job shadows um, so that we can avoid those mistakes, which is another piece, a component of our model. Yeah. So, Brandon, we're holding you in reserve. You're like our cleanup hitter, so don't worry. <laughs> Just like start limbering up over there. Okay. <laughs> Just like... <laughs> tap here. But before we go there, so uh, great, Ed, uh, lots of conversation about workplace values and trying to help kids kind of sharpen their idea of what they want. But back to Sean's earlier comment about it's, it all happening through practice, practice pra and the application of the stuff that they want to try out. What does that look like in a K-8 yeah. environment? Absolutely. Well, you, you can't scale internships. You can't scale putting students on buses to take them out. I can't put 17,000 students on buses. So we have a framework to do this in the practice. Every child has the opportunity to explore, to simulate, to meet a pro and practice across the Holland framework, which maybe we'll discuss later. But students are doing as if experiences. The teachers are masterful at integrating career experience into what's already happening in the classroom. And it takes some time for the mindset to shift. How can I do this? I'm busy, I don't have time. But please ask the Cohen Valley teachers that are here right now. 
They're integrating the careers, being a forester. Mr. Coleman says, I got my science in, I got my research in, I got my persuasive writing, my students are going outside. We're, it's all in there, but it all happens in sequence. So after you simulate and try it on, because every child should have the opportunity to try on a career, then they meet the pro virtually through NEPRIS. And can you imagine the questions of our students when they get a chance to meet a pro virtually? Because the hands are up across the class and the pros asking, how did these students get so prepared for these questions? Because they've been prepped through the process, the experience, and at the end, the big question, was it for you or was it not for you? And so that reflection is critical. Yeah. So we would love to have industry partners that can help us scale that. It's not, it's not really possible you know, to scale internships for every child, I don't think. We have a principal here who does it in his school for every child. At scale in the public school system, don't know if it's possible. How do we create these experiences integrated, embedded into the classroom through the coursework so they can see it for themselves? Ask the teachers how they're doing it. T hashtag teacher talent. Magnificent talent from these educators. Cajon Valley educators, can you raise your hand just so we see who you are? So look around you. If you have questions for these people who are doing this work, find them right afterwards. And thank you for all. So before we leave you, let's and it's, so you and it's, not, yeah. it's not play. I mean, yeah. it's play in the sense that some people are like, oh, it's make-believe. Don't tell the child that it's make-believe. <laughs> Mr. Coleman takes them outside for the forester unit. They put on hard hats yeah. and go outside. They're taking measurements, they're exploring, they're understanding the ecology. It's only make-believe to the extent that you suck at your job yeah. and make it make-believe for them, <laughs> right? I mean, truly, if you make it real when you step into that classroom today, and Mr. Coleman does that, and so do the others that are here, entrepreneurship, this is what's happening. Yep. We're doing this, and you're part of my team. Let's go do it. And you, you can't, they're not slacking. Yep. They're not slacking. So, David Perkins at Project Zero at Harvard calls this junior versions, right? He wrote a book called Whole Game Learning. It's all about how sports, but also every other form of extracurricular activity in high schools, yes. which is where kids learn this stuff right now, they're all junior versions of real, real world stuff. And, and the reason why junior versions work is that they have all the challenges and all the attributes of, of, of that work out there but they're sort of reduced and sort of contained to, uh, to a, an, an attainable you know, context for kids in high school. Yeah, so I, this is, it's a great book and it's short. We're gonna just start a whole book club right here. Okay, so Todd Rose, there was a first one, Dark Horse. This one is um, Whole Game Learning by David Perkins. So one last question, you mentioned a framework, Holland Frank, what kind of framework? So the most researched of all vocational typologies is the Holland Framework. It was designed back in the late 60s. Dr. John Holland was a professor at University of Wisconsin, finished his career at Johns Hopkins University. And uh, the Holland Framework is a typology for understanding interests and interest alignment. Major universities, Ohio State, Oklahoma State, Arizona State, classify their majors by Holland, the RIASEC. Um, and then, of course, the ONET, the government's database of jobs with more than 2,000 plus careers, classifies all the careers based on the Holland Framework. So our students, our young people, starting as early as transitional kindergarten, are starting to learn about their interests aligned to Holland. And just how powerful it can be is, because we're really building a meta skill for students to manage their careers. Mm -hmm. And so when a student can read Charlotte's Web and say, Charlotte is enterprising because she negotiated a deal with the farmer in order to save the egg sack. And she's in third grade. And I asked the teacher, because I see the writing up on the poster board, can you explain what happened to here for this to take place? And she goes, I didn't ask the students to do it. They did it themselves. So it becomes a thinking process where the student is now understanding themselves, what they're reading, and making the connections naturally. And so we're seeing in the Lemonade Wars and Charlotte's Web, it's happening organically and it's never been done before in this, in this manner. Kudos back to our educators. Great. Good, okay. So let's move to St. Vrain and this partnership, um, which we discovered only like three years ago, two, two years ago. It is maybe the, the deepest example of uh, 
community industry high school partnership that, that we've seen. Um, so Brandon, you want to describe where it came from, what it looks like, how it works, and what it does for the kids? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. I, what, I, what I'm thinking and what I really want to uh, impart on the, the audience here is just the importance of partnerships in general. Uh, and I think when we talk about partnerships, we, we're thinking industry partners, you bring business uh, mentors in to work with, with your students. But it's not just that, it's also higher education. You've got to put the whole, whole thing together. Um, Eric mentioned earlier that you know, b before we you know, started our venture together and the, the P-TECH program at Skyline High School, St. Green Valley Schools, um, we went on our, our, our listening tour of industries out there and asked them, well, what are you looking for in an employee? We went on Indeed.com and we looked at job postings in our, our region and we, we read, you know, here's, here's what they're looking for in new employees for the, the types of jobs that, uh, that we're trying to prepare our students for. And in fact, I would, I would encourage each one of you to do that. Go on and say, okay, here are the types of jobs I think I'm preparing my students for. This is what we're getting them ready to do. And then read those postings. And 98% of them are going to say requires a bachelor's degree. So okay, how do I do that? You know, how do I control that from the eighth grade? How do I control that from you know, the 10th grade? What, how does this whole thing connect, mm -hmm. right? So as you're going out and you're creating partnerships and you're developing your curriculum and you're trying to align a scope and sequence and you're trying to create mentorships and opportunities for your students, you've got to keep this whole picture in mind. And if you're not bringing higher ed to the table to work with you in developing your K-12 yeah. curriculum and structure, then you're missing it. Right, that, that component is absolutely critical. And guess what? It also helps you if you're running into bureaucratic roadblocks, blo right? You, you go to your curriculum director, or you go to the state, the Department of Education, and say, here's what we want to build. You know, I know the state standards say this, this, and this, but we need to kind of wedge it in here because we're, we're doing something special. Yep. How do you do something special and overcome those bureaucratic obstacles? bureaucratic obstacles, well, so you're much more likely to overcome those obstacles if you have a representative, um, not only from industry, who's sitting at the table also, but from higher education. And all three of you go together and advocate, lobby for a change that will, will allow you to do something different and innovative to change, change the environment in your, your building. So what did we do? We, we sat down and we looked at all these um, all these different requirements, this is what we need. We sat down with IBM. IBM is a dream, right? I mean, P-TECH is kind of their thing. They started it, right? Um, to, to the extent uh, you, you're not familiar with P-TECH, just look at ptech.org. There's a website, there are all kinds of you know, news articles and, and feel-good stories. But another really important piece to this equation and something that, you know, I think, I think when you go to a, a, a conference like this and you see all the tools and all of the resources and all the help that is out there, sometimes this is lost in the conversation. At the very foundation of everything we do, and you know this, especially the teachers who are in the trenches doing it day by day, you know this, everything we do, it's a lot of hard work. Right? There, there's, you're going to be up late at night, you're going to work on weekends, work at, you know, your three-year holiday. It's a lot of hard work to create these opportunities for your students. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. If they do, they're trying to sell you something. That's it, right? It's a lot of hard work, right? Getting our industry partner, having somebody like Eric that I can call any or text any time, day or night, uh, our, our Front Range Community Colleges, our higher ed uh, mm -hmm. partner who, you know, the same type of relationship. Building those types of partnerships and relationships, absolutely critical to making this whole thing work. Um, looking at what industry needs, making sure that we are as agile and we are as flexible as we want our students to be, right? Uh, to, to create a, a receptacle that is rigid and then say to, you know, to the, the students who are inside that, that you know, box, hey, you have to be agile and flexible, doesn't make sense, right? We all hear about individualized learning and agile learning for students, that's what we need to do. And if we don't reflect that and create an environment where we're willing to do that also, it doesn't work, right? So after we interviewed the, the different businesses out there, after we kind of got an idea of what we were looking at, 
we sat down and we built our, our scope and sequence, integrated our, our college classes with our high school classes, working with higher ed and, and industry. And we came up with this beautiful five-year plan. We, you know, through the P-TECH program, we're allowed to go to a fifth or a sixth year of high school if we need to. Have this beautiful, beautiful five-year plan. And in the first semester, we realized that it wasn't going to work. And we had to scrap the whole thing and start all over. And you know, literally, we go semester by semester. We have an individual counselor who's working with each of our kids to come up with an individual path for each of those. And that wasn't our focus when we first started. It wasn't, hey, we're going to do individualized learning for each of our kids. Huh. Our focus was, hey, we're going to do p and we're going to get them all through. What we realized as we were going through the process is we had to individualize each of their pathways. Huh. So it has really uh, created this nurturing environment where every student is, is an individual. Um, and we are going to adapt to their needs and create opportunities specific to, to them. You want to add to that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I am stationed in the school Monday through Thursday. Uh, I, I, it's a really weird IBM job in which I, they say, oh, you're out of IBM Boulder. And I'm like, no, I'm out of Skyline High School. And they're like, what? what's going on there? <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you're working with our students, you and I, any great educator in this room knows that when you create and you set the bar high and you give students the proper supports they need, they will meet them. Uh, so Brandon talked about how we had to scrap a five-year plan. What he didn't say is that we have a number of our students completing the program in four years. So they're gonna earn their high school diploma and their associate's degree. Uh, so this, this is a bit surreal, um, but we have earned, so we're in our, this is two and a half years, right, because we're thinking of semesters. In two and a half years, across 152 students, we have earned 1,792 college credits. Every one of our students that was ready for internships, so we had 27 applicants, all 27 of those applicants received internships and will, inter, uh, will be interns at IBM this summer. Now, what I didn't tell you is that there was a wealth of hard work that went into that. Um, we do big, large mentor events. That's one of the pieces that I oversee. And our first year, we work on pathway exposure because, again, we want our students to identify the pathways that work best for them. The second year, we work on soft skill development, which is huge because you can be an amazing engineer, yeah. but if you can't collaborate in an agile environment, there's no way that you're gonna have a long career as an engineer. Uh, so we work on soft skill development, at which I actually wrote an entire curriculum for, and if you're interested on in seeing the soft skill curriculum that I have, it's, it's free, you know, I'll definitely give it to you. Uh, and then the last one is professionalism. That's all of year three, and we have four large events. The first one is, is about being a professional in the workplace. The second one is on resume building. The third one is mock interviews, and our last one was developing and creating a LinkedIn profile uh, so that you can further network yourself. And you know, like Brandon said, this is really hard work. One thing that I would encourage all districts, all teachers, whoever, get out and job shadow yourself. Um, there is a program through Colorado Succeeds in Colorado, uh, and it's called, I believe, Teacher Connect. And Teacher Connect is where you do the reverse job shadow, where teachers are able to leave the classroom, go out, see a day in industry, and understand what are the demands of the professionals that are out there, and then come back. Anybody aware of a program like that in your state? This is fairly unique. Yeah. 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 Great. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to move into Q&A, but we're going to flip it a little bit and start by asking you all a question. Because um, as I'm hearing this from St. Vrain, and there's a, a lot that you haven't heard from the, these guys about their district, you know, how they have this like a total design thinking and STEM focus. They they have this amazing innovation center that is like the biggest makerspace you ever saw. They employ 
1,200 juniors and seniors and pay them to teach design thinking skills to the younger kids. You know, I mean, it's just like, the, it just goes on and on and on. So my question for you is, um, especially the educators in the room, you're listening to all this and already lodging in your head um, what, you know, the reasons why that would be hard to do in our district. So somebody, so Mike Runners, if you got mics, yeah. Just, just, let's just send up a couple of those yeah buts. You know, what, what, what are the reasons why you couldn't in your community do what you've just been hearing, either at the K-8 level or at the high school level? Oh, you're already doing it already, apparently. <laughs> is, is that right? Is that, so this is all the choir and you're already, yeah. Where? Anybody got a yeah, but you want to offer up, or See, are you seeing like there, totally ser serene and clear field ahead? Okay, go ahead. Hi, Thanks. I'm Regina Rosie Mitchell, and I work at an independent all-girls school in Los Angeles, huh. where we are doing a bit of this, and I think we have a problem that I don't think is it's a bit more unique, where we have students who are so on the college track and have a very um, limited vision of what success looks like and think that that means AP classes, getting straight A's, or you know, getting a 4.8 GPA and yeah. thinking that Ivy League is the only option. Yeah. And so these extra things that we offer that are real world and that we know that students need, they're not seeing that as being super important. As they feel extra, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Great, comments. Let's start with St. Vrain folks. You know, I, that, that's a very real issue. I mean, we, we, we face that as well. Um, and, you know, the, the, I think that the challenge, when we talk about partnerships and bring it back to that, the partners in the program, we're, we're both, parents are, are a critical component of that as well, right? Because a lot of the pressure that comes on a student to uh, get the 4.8 GPA and you got to make sure it's all AP and you got to make sure it all lines up so that you can get into the Ivy League school when you apply for college, et cetera, et cetera, right? A lot of that pressure comes back to the parents. And to the extent you can get the parents tied into, okay, look, let's, let's think about this. You know, what, do you, what's your, what are you passionate about? What makes you happy, right? What, what drives you to, to wanna be excellent? And now let's, let's try to throw that into the mix along with experiential education, you know, what project-based learning or, or mentorship at your age. Um, maybe it means you go to Cal Poly and not to Harvard, I don't know, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, the demographic of the students that you're, you're working with probably are, you know, whether they're doing the experimental education track or the AP track, um, they're going to end up, you know, in their dream school anyway. So make sure that when you're doing the counseling on each of those individual students, you know, make sure that uh, you're bringing the, the parents into the fold, and the partnerships go up and they go down in, in so many different directions. Yeah. John? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a great, great point. I think the parents are critical, and, and there's, there's an element of balance in, in all of this. And, and what we found, I mean, on the, on the K-12 platform, there are probably 115,000 students, and there are many of those students that um, are, are those students. They're very focused on that traditional path. As we've introduced components of career readiness and, and have allowed students to opt into the career readiness program, it, it is the parents who are seeing the value of project-based learning, uh, collaboration, the uh, I inserting industry in the conversations, and, and job shadowing as, as these real-world um, experiences and tools that, that they'd like their sons and daughters to experience, no matter what their trajectory is. And so we're finding that it, it is, it is a, a sense of, of balance between that hardcore curricula and, and that focus and also the career readiness. Yeah, Ed. I think there's another piece, there's another piece as well um, to share with parents um, uh, and that they may not be aware of, that student engagement in schools peaks at fifth grade and bottoms out in 11th grade. And then when you look at employee engagement over the last decade, it hovers around 30% of workers out in the world of work being engaged, according to Gallup research. So what do you want for your child? What ROI are you seeking for your child along this journey? 
it's also <laughs> this is book number three in our book club. <laughs> um, our Kids by Bob Putnam, Robert Putnam, uh, does a lot of talk about um, what all the research shows people value as the most powerful, enduring learning experiences that they ever had. They all tend to be extracurricular or outside of school. And, and so what you're hearing up here is a, a rethink of what school should value so that the, that kind of powerful, enduring learning is actually the work of the school, not just the after school stuff. You know? And so if you get every student and their parents in the school to read that book, that would be our prescription. Okay, let's open it up to questions. Yeah, Helen. Executive Director of E3 Civic High right here downtown. And uh, we have a career uh, college and workforce light prep school. Our challenge is that in the 12th grade, we send all 100 of our seniors out to internships. So where is the conversation at the employer level, at the business community, to increase our capacity and others and their capacity to get seniors into the workplace oh. so they can experience meaningful, competent, hands-on, relevant work, um, but it's a challenge with, of course, high school students being in the workplace. Uh -huh. But where's the conversation with employers that will not only protect those relationships, but build on those relationships so that we can continue to do the work and other schools can get in the work? Uh, because our scholars go out nine months of the year after we do um, two months of prep work, and they're expected to have these meaningful experiences around design thinking, around projects, and what the workplace is doing. So if you could help me understand maybe where the conversation is going with our business community to you know, build a bridge and have a tighter partnership. So, so before I answer that, can we give it up to her for 100 internships? Yeah, that's, seriously. That's amazing. All right. That's, that's, that's really wonderful work, and that's, you know, that's what we need. We need more of that in terms of the actual physical job placement. Now, just because we have P-TECH doesn't mean that that always translates into our local area. So like I said, it's a, it's a global model. So I think it's somebody to facilitate and build the relationships with the employers to gain a mutual understanding of what are the skills that are needed and how do we get our students there. And when our students are there, we need you to back that up. Uh, so, for instance, with our internships, uh, spoiler alert, Brandon, I had a lot, of, a lot of conversations with managers, and I'm saying, hey, if our students deliver on these skills, this kid is going to have their associate's degree next year, and I need you to have an opportunity for them. I need you to step up to the plate. I have a kid. He's ready. And, you know, I think it's really based on the relationships that you build with those managers and creating a clear understanding. And again, it's, it's up to that hard work. We have 27 internship opportunities and there's, I think there's 20 different managers. So 20 different managers, I'm getting out there, I'm, I'm building that network, so. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you've done a fantastic job so far and I would say that um, we, we have found that that is where the heavy lifting is. It's, it's, a day-by-day -day effort at, at building relationships, as was mentioned. But, um, but past that, it, I, I think our experiences um, will vary for students as they go out. Job shadowing has been mentioned here as, as a great first effort to get them out, to have industry exposure through uh, NEPRIS and other virtual means to get uh, industry uh, exposure and feedback. Then if it's iterative, it's a longer cycle of, uh, of exposure to industry versus a one-time um, internship sh uh, shot. And so that's what we've tried to focus on, the iterative nature over four years versus just a senior year. Did you guys want to, yeah. Just r real quickly, um, you know, so one of, the things we, one of the things I liked about the P-TECH program, we, we identify partners who are gonna be, you know, this is our part, IBM is our partner for this program. And part of that really, we have an MOU with IBM saying here are the things that the industry is going to bring to the table. One of those things, you're going to interview my students for a job if there is a job available that matches their skill set. So we've made that very clear in our relationship from the very beginning. But you know, I've also been involved in starting new P-TECH projects. I'm, I'm involved with one right now where you know, it's not an IBM, where it wasn't their original idea. They're just kind of you know, want to work with the school district and we kind of pitched them P-TECH, walk into the room and do the cold pitch, say, hey, here's a program for you. 
how about it, that type of thing, and here's how it works. We still try to manage those expectations up front. Say, hey, look, when it's all, all said and done, these students, we're, they're going to float their resume to you. We, we would hope that after this long-term interview, and we frame it that way, you have nine months in your case. In our case, they start as ninth graders, so four years to get to know these students. We would hope that just because they don't have a bachelor's degree, right, which is requirement on, on your job posting on you know, indeed.com or whatever, just because they don't have that, you've gotten to know this student and you know the potential that is there. You know the maturity level that's there. Most of the job, or most of the businesses we interviewed when we did our original turnaround, they just used the bachelor's degree as a proxy for maturity. They didn't care what the degree was even in, right? They just wanted to know that the students had, you know, were, were willing to stick to it and get through it, you know, a little bit older, a little bit wiser, a little bit, you know, more mature than that, that kid coming straight out of high school. Well, if we frame that conversation with those industry partners at the very beginning, this is a long-term interview. You need to know what we're expecting on the other side of this. Maybe you have a couple of your industry partners walk away. You don't get those mentorships. Well, that's okay, right? You want to make sure that it's clear what you're asking for when you put your students in the workplace for mentorships with them. Two sentences, Ed. We're missing a lot of kids. We're talking about urban kids today. What about the rural kids? Mm. So why are we not using something like Upwork in order to create gig opportunities for students, wherever it is they are in the middle of nowhere, can't get to someplace? We need to be not forgetting about those kids that are in Borrego Springs and other places where there is an industry. Why are we not using technology to push out gig opportunities for those students to do PBL in their classrooms right through the gig? So let's close with the famous quote from the immortal Wayne Gretzky, right? This is, this is all about helping our kids and our schools move to not where the puck is, but where the puck is going, right? That's what this is all about. You four, thank you so much. Let's thank our panel, everybody. Yeah. <clears throat> and thank all of you for coming.